Oh, is it on mute mode? Well, I have it on this screen because we'll pop up there when we go live. We're live on here. We can't adjust the volume on the webcam. Is that where we're? No, that's all kind of just there's no buttons even. even Are we live? How about this one here? Okay. Check this here, one out. We're, we're on. Okay. Hey, can you hear us now? They can hear us. I bet you guys can hear us this time, huh? The anticipation is unbearable. Hello? Are we like zoomed in too far or something? It's hey. lagging. Is that the camera angle that we got going on around here? What happened? I think you're just sitting close. All right. Is that the camera? Answer. Check the other camera angle there. This one. <laughs> Minimize. Minim there it is. Sound and picture. Hello. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, yep. They hear us. Okay. Woo! Why, howdy. Hello. Oh, for God's sakes. Hey, Lou. Come hey, come here. behind us, bro. You know I'm camera shy. Ah, uh, he's scared. <laughs> come over. We're just gonna upload a podcast, <laughs> and the camera's rolling. And he's all getting sweaty back here. Hey guys, we got Rex and we got Lou and we got Casey, the whole crew. Howdy. Hey, so you're going to keep track of them things, right? Yes. Oh, good, good, good. Okay. So is there like a way to zoom out on this thing without getting too like goofy? Now we're probably screwed up. We should probably just leave it alone, huh? Yeah, I don't, I don't really want to mess with it. It's been glitchy. But yeah, we'll just roll, roll this way. We'll just back up. I'll back up with my good friend Lou here. Oh. Zoom out. <clears throat> zoom out. There. Mm. All right, cool. So it's good to see you guys. We are going to talk about long range rifle basics. We had a lot, a lot of questions from a lot of folks, and they often apologize for being what they call a noob. Now, what's a noob? Can you explain that? You're younger. Uh, noob is generally somebody who doesn't know much about a subject, is just starting out in something. Sure. They're and that's new. awesome. Yeah, I don't chase them guys up because that's why we're on uh, YouTube, right? Because we want to help uh, people learn stuff. So a lot of times we jump into the, the river totally swimming or hit the ground running, you know. And so this video, we're going to talk about just some basic stuff. And if you guys want to talk crazy stuff or advanced stuff, that's fine too. Whatever you guys ask, we'll talk about. Ask anything. Uh, but we're going to concentrate on that as we get it started here. So, Casey, you are kind of a long-range rifle noob. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, Casey, believe it or not, is our techie, and she is also on the Rex Reviews podcast show. She participates in the discussions there. She's very smart, but she is not, like, super into rifles and stuff. So, she's perfect candidate to help ask the proper questions because, uh, you know, that's why we picked this crew because we're so diverse. We got... A whole lot of different experience up here from we all have our sectors of responsibility that we're smart at. And so this is going to be awesome for helping assist us with the questions. You see any good questions there yet? Or <laughs> uh, Any feedback on Remington 700 Magpul rifle? Oh, the Magpul rifle. Is, who is this asking this? I was just playing Southern with... Muscle. Yeah, I was just playing with one this weekend. And I wonder they're probably spying. On hmm. stuff, and they saw some of the top secret activity. Yeah, I just shoot the Remington 700 mag pull this weekend uh, in a certain place, and um, it's an interesting setup. I think it's very ergonomic for those of you who aren't familiar. The Remington 700 mag pull is basically it has a, a heavy barrel. Uh, this one I think had a 22 or a 24 inch barrel. I can't remember the exact configuration, but it was heavy. One in ten twist. It had the 5R rifling, which is really good. Uh, the rifle did shoot really straight once we got it settled in. Now, uh, the Magpul stock is what is kind of the big feature of the Magpul rifle. And uh, it's kind of a plastic stock over a chassis, an aluminum chassis. But there's like plastic skins on the outside of it that, that are very uh, modular. And they have little tiny screws that hold it into the chassis part. So you can take out a series of spacers to adjust your length of pull in your buttstock. They have removable cheek pieces so you can get your cheek well different. So it's very nice for ergonomics. You can really uh, adjust it exactly. Uh, one of the guys I was shooting with was a really tall guy with long arms. So we just put in all the spacers and use the appropriate cheek piece for the size uh, rings he was using and base and everything. And... Um, 
the the issue with that particular setup where i would caution people to go that way would be that there's so many different parts of the stock that all got to connect together and it's all kind of a injection molded style synthetic material um and i'm not sure exactly what magpul uses on that stock but i anticipated when we started playing with the rifle and getting it all set up um that it might have slight harmonic settling issues and what we mean by that is when you put all these different stock spacers in under recoil what happens is all that stuff is going to have some degree of microscopic looseness now when you get it all together you got to squish it together and there's a little piece with the hole in it and you got to get the screw in there and then you turn it in and it seems like it's tight but it's in all reality a rifle stock has to be like super monolithic one piece of material absolutely no wiggling any wiggling is going to translate to uh, loss of precision downrange you'll see that on paper relatively easily and so what i anticipated what it would happen with that rifle is exactly what happened it took quite a while to settle it in so what that means is we started zeroing the, the weapon and uh go ahead sorry oh you're reading I think some, keep going some good ones <laughs> <laughs> you're distracting her and uh <laughs> and so what happens is as the recoil happens uh not only is the action inside the aluminum bedding shifting just a tiny bit to find its final place because as good as aluminum bedding is there is a little bit of play there's deformation of the aluminum under recoil on a microscopic or very tiny level that does occur as the rifle is settling in a brand new rifle the recoil lug is going to find a spot where it's happy being seated uh the screws are going to tighten up so as you're shooting a rifle very brand new virgin rifle out of the box you want to continuously make sure everything's tight in your stock so your action screws you kind of just go and give them a turn make sure they're not loosening up because they're going to find that wiggle room and when it does find that wiggle room it's going to be in a loose spot so you got to tighten it up um and it seems like with the butt stock spacers and everything else there's a certain amount of squish backwards to get everything uh lined up or or mated or settled in recoil wise and so what we experienced was a uh, first shot uh flyer pretty much every time about two minutes off from the normal point of impact after handling the rifle. And it didn't have anything to do with the hot barrel or the bore, because we made sure the bore was very nicely seasoned and broken and it reached its fouling and copper equilibrium before we did that. Um, so we got the rifle all warmed up and it was grouping very well. I shot like half minute of angle to three quarter minute of angle. Um, I think the best group we had was half and the average group size was right about three quarter well under a minute of angle so it was a good shoot rifle 175 federal uh, match kings or whatever the gold medal stuff um factory ammo real good shooter super sniper scope and all that but um and we we made sure that the mounts and the rings and everything was good but due to the stock is what i'm going to pin it on just based on my experience uh there's any tiny bit of wiggle it doesn't matter how much it is is going to make a significant shift and so on the first shot anytime you'd pick up the rifle put it in the bag carry it around grab it by the barrel or, or do something that would shift one of any one of those parts of the buttstock then when you're shooting it under recoil it's going to shift a little bit differently under recoil and uh, harmonically it's going to throw the shot just uh, ever so slightly and so with those rifles there's a lot of bugs to be worked out if you got a little bit of wiggle so just be advised that if you're using it in field applications when you get the rifle out of its transit or if it's bouncing around in the car you want to fire around or or try to get it seated to the rear as best you can to get that wiggle out of there but honestly to reach that true harmonic equilibrium with the tightness of the stock you have to shoot it a couple times after you shoot it once or twice it's settled in and it shoots perfectly straight and it groups well and after it cools completely off, if you don't shift the lay of the rifle and the rifle stock, it'll continue to put them in on that same group. So that eliminates the temperature from the variable. So the mag pull design is problematic, in my opinion, for precision applications. Uh, there was a question. <laughs> you like that one? <laughs> <laughs> in all of this. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, there was a question somebody had asked about your opinion on thermal. So Thermal uh, imaging? Yeah. Would you hand me my lovely notes there on top of the printer? Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I was talking to some dudes who know a lot about thermal imaging and the high speed night vision gear, the forty thousand dollar stuff that they're testing now, the cutting edge technology. And I took a lot of notes here. Some okay, of this is some cool stuff. Yeah, this is actually some of this is probably top secret, and I ain't gonna tell you who it is. Um for thermals, the best one is the PBS twenty seven that's really um 
you know, you can spend more money to get better stuff. I mean, this one's in the twenty thousand or fourteen thousand dollar range, uh, but it's one that you mount in front of a daytime optic, and uh, that's the best way to go if you're shooting long. Because we're talking long range rifle, I presume that's what you're asking about. But if you're going to use a scoped rifle, this is one that's very repeatable in terms of you mount it in front of your daytime optic. You clamp her down, and it's not going to have a zero shift much more than a minute, or it'll usually be less than a minute of angle. That's hard to find in a lot of other units, even expensive units like five thousand dollar units. Uh, but the PBS twenty seven um, or one of the good clones is the best IR. Uh, actually, uh, you can get the I two technology too. Sorry, best bang for the buck. It's the best bang for the buck. Oh man! Now we just started releasing some night vision review stuff. Um, we're getting started on that and I'm not the expert on night vision. Let's just put it like that right off the bat. There are channels dedicated to night vision and I think that a lot of the hog hunters down in Texas are going to have the corner on this market. However, for the applications of long range precision fire, I do want to get into it because it's going to be a different type of night vision than what a lot of guys are going to use for close range hog hunting. It's a whole nother set of selection criteria because you have to be very fussy that the thing ain't going to have any zero shift. Now, on other weapons, there might be other, uh, there's a lot of stuff on the market. There's pulsars and all this neat stuff. You can hook your cameras in there. You can get stuff for a thousand bucks. It works great for like rapid target engagement, close range with an AR 15, whatever kind of shooting for hogs. That's fine. Uh, if you're shooting like 600 or 800 or 1,000 yards in the dark, you start to go up in price. Um, but in general, from what I'm being told from guys that I have seriously vetted in their competency and such things, um, FLIR, FLIR, is one of the outfits. I think they bought like Armisite or Merged or some kind of deal. But those units and Armisite both produce very good units for the money. Like you'll get a lot more for your money. And uh, they're field usable units they're tough they're built really good and i did get a really really affordable unit in for review you can check out the channel and see that it's on the uh, world war z dedicated rifle scope it's like 375 bucks or something on optics planet if you go on there it's made by armisite and it's what used to be back in the day the cutting edge military technology right and this this ain't a military scope but i'm talking about the you know the general technology trend uh so it's definitely way better than seeing an, or you know than pitch black dark um but it's not going to be a long range optic though uh, you're going to be limited with something like that so you got to spend I'd say look at the three and five thousand dollar armasites probably would be a good way to get into the game. Um, the PVS twenty seven is probably the best one, but they're kind of expensive. Some cool yeah, tools, though, man. Oh yeah, lots of good tools. There's lots of lots of different stuff out there, and that field, by the way, is rapidly evolving to the point where it's difficult to keep up with it. Um, so there's always new stuff on the market, and tomorrow it could all change. Um, what Some was guys. our most recent podcast about? Somebody was asking if we have a new one up. Oh yeah, we just uh, just uploaded a podcast like twelve minutes ago. We're talking about like campfire ghost stories and stuff. That you know, and it's funny because when we recorded that one, I thought, man, this is like kind of like boring or or kind of like, are they going to really want to listen to this? What do you think looking back on it, dude? When I was like listening to it when I'm driving around or whatever, just to like edit it and write down which things I got to edit out, like when I slip and say a naughty word or whatever, uh -huh. which does happen from time to time. Um, it was like really entertaining, actually. Like I get a kick out of it. Maybe yeah. I just like ghost stories. There were know. some good tales in the, there, though. We, yeah, uh, we covered a lot of stuff. Yeah, we did, man. And we we talk about all. And Casey talks about her past and how crazy and psychotic she used to be it's pretty Don't funny listen. podcast yeah check it yeah, out pass. if you want to just Moving get to on. know us all better we're just jabbering on that one the whole time so it's fun <laughs> it's a pretty lighthearted one it was a lighthearted one it was actually fun to do because we've been so busy with projects lately that we've all been kind of almost burned out to tell the truth uh so sometimes you just like what are we going to do a podcast on i don't know just start talking you know and then it kind of goes from there so it was fun though yeah um somebody did mention too. somebody said that they love your bible study but have you ever considered reading children's books Ch oh dude i'm the best children's book reader ever somebody they on their want to buy, <laughs> they want to buy your audio books really yeah. yeah you mean like i would read a children's book or i'd write the children's book whatever I mean both. I, you don't want to i i'm not going to write no children's <laughs> books that's going to be too scary okay like 
But uh, I like Owl Babies. You ever read that book about the mama owl that goes and feeds the baby owls when they're all worried where mama went and she comes back? Yeah. Uh, I don't know that at one. one time in my life, I used to, I was going to do education at one time. And uh, they make you do like uh, they put you through the ringer and do the edge. You know, you got to teach the little kids or whatever. Teach all of them. Oh man, that was fun. They got a kick out. I am a really good storyteller with them little kids, man. <laughs> it was fun, you, yeah. You so they got a kick. They're something. just so into it, you know. And I was into it. Maybe that's why they thought it was fun because I liked the book too. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it makes a good teacher, though. Yeah, it's all right. So um, should we get? Wait, go ahead. Do yeah. they have another question? Yeah. What was the best magnification for a thousand plus yards? The best magnification? Yeah. Okay, now there's a general rule that people have cited that's actually not bad. Uh, one power magnification for every 100 yards. So for 100, all you need is one power. For 200, you know, then a two power might be a little better. In all, in all honesty, you can shoot very effectively up to three or 400 with one power red dot, right? Um, but if you're shooting at 500, a five power will basically have you covered on normal size targets, right? Like a deer or a bad guy or whatever. So at a thousand, you get you know, uh, ten power at is least. pretty adequate. Yeah, it, yeah, at least a ten power. Um, you know, if you have a little bit less than that, it's going to be a little bit difficult to get rolling. Um, you know, in twelve hundred and so on. You know, twelve power, and that's actually a pretty good rule of thumb. And to tell the truth, that's about how I usually dial it in, just automatically. I usually adjust a ten power inside. Or I mean, outside 500 yards, just automatically, I just go straight to 10 power on a static target one that's not moving around, right? So you just that works pretty good. Um, overall, 10 power is my favorite. If you're running a variable, you got a huge spread you can get. Um, it's nicer to have higher magnification, but you only really want to spend the money on on higher magnification if you're going to buy the good glass. If you're buying high magnification on cheap scope, you might as well just quit while you're ahead because it's just going to magnify a really blurry image. So anything over 12 or 15 power, you need to have high density glass, what people call HD glass. Some people think that's high definition, but it's high density. It's a apochromatically corrected glass with three different layers of material. It brings all three wavelengths exactly into the same focal point, which gives you a clear image even at high magnifications. So 15 power scope for 1500 yards, but you do need HD glass when you get into that. Otherwise just run a straight 10, up to a straight 10 or even a straight 12, you don't need HD glass. You can run $300 glass and you'll still see fine enough. Um, so yep, hopefully that explains that deal. So revolver of choice? Revolver of choice, well I always used to carry a Ruger Red Hawk. That was one of my first carry guns. When you're a young guy, you know, like 16. <laughs> uh, Ruger what? Red Hawk. And what it, was that? It's a big double action. I should have brought a big hand, pile of handguns in here. That'd be fun. But it's a big double action 44 Magnum. Oh, boy. Made by Ruger. Oh, see. The you hear that, phone. guys? That is a phone. It has a curly cord on it. It has the buttons on it. That's my actual phone. That's like from 1982, that phone right there. My grandma had one of those at her house. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> I am a dinosaur after all, right, guys? But yeah, so yeah, I hope that answers your question, kind of. Um, There was something else. Or did I get interrupt her? What were we even talking about? I don't remember. No Revolver of choice? Yeah, Ruger Red Hawk. That's what I carried when I was a kid. Did or you got that one? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Who's this oh. silent Bob guy in the middle? That's Lou. Lou. He's chilling. He's he's the <laughs> podcast master. He's got the golden voice on our podcast radio show, man. Yeah, he face for radio. That. Face for radio. That's why I stay <laughs> off camera usually. <laughs> just, oh, Lou. you scared him off. I'll just Lou. way to go, Sorry. guys. You're screwing it all up. Get back here, Lou. Uh, <laughs> hey, should we go over some of the uh, basic stuff you think, Casey? Yes. Okay. okay. So unless they go ahead. As we said earlier, I'm a complete noob when it comes to guns. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask really basic questions. So you're probably all going to be way above me. Yeah. But for anybody. So you can anybody... make fun of her on the, on the commentaries <laughs> while she's Yeah, you can confused. make fun of me. That's fine. But we'll be confused too, right, Lou? I usually am. <laughs> I probably will get it wrong anyways. And everyone's like, yeah, you said the improper term, you idiot. Oh, but um, man. yeah, it'll be right. But anyway, I'll be an idiot so that you guys don't have to. And it's not being an idiot. If I was in the <laughs> makeup aisle, like I was in the makeup aisle with the wife the other day, and she's looking for some kind of, what, what I don't even know what it's called. Like a, all right, you know about makeup, right? Mm -hmm. What's the one that makes everything the same color? Like it's the color. Like it's basically, yeah, it's, it's like the foundation? skin color. Foundation. Foundation, yeah, what's what you that? you build the house on. She's like, oh, I need a foundation. <laughs> I'm like, 
Okay, so I'm like looking at shampoo. I don't know what she's talking oh, about, man. Go to Menards. They got a sale on yeah. cinder blocks. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, paver sand or what? So yeah, any, no such thing as a dumb question. Then there's no such thing as a dumb question. Just because, and if someone's starting to be interested in it, that's what we're geared for. And so for the RX17 upcoming seminar. Um, there's a lot of folks who we did kind of an informal poll. I think Paul McCoy was in communication with a lot of people. And from what he, what Intel he gave me, he said that there's a lot of brand new shooters who are like totally new. So I can't assume or that, you know, I have no idea what level that means. So we're just going to cover some super basic stuff in this video. And then later on, and we, we do want to release this relatively close to the actual class. So that is fresh in the brain. But I'm going to go over some things like basics, like what's a minute of angle? People always say, minute of angle or what's an elevation turret? You know, stuff like that that we just sometimes start talking about and no one knows what the hell we're talking about. So we'll cover that in some other videos after a minute. Oh, perfect. Let's do this now. Okay. <laughs> so uh, this is a rifle, right? Now this is actually, I'm going to review this one. This is a nice one. What do we have here? This is an axial precision convergence. And what's the story with the barrel there? That's different. Yeah, that's a carbon fiber uh, wrap, that barrel. That's kind of one of them high-tech, lightweight deals. And see, uh, here, go ahead and hold that one time. It's lighter than it seems, right? Yeah, it's not Yeah, bad. pretty cool. Can I check her out? Yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know a lot of you see the vortex on there and making fun of me already. Gonna ask I'm going to give that. it a second chance. I'll try it. You know, a lot instance. of guys run them things and they really like them. So I'm going to give this one a shot. This is one of the really uh, high-end model ones. Are you seeing comments on there or what? So that's what a rifle looks like. <laughs> oh, you smarty pants guy, you. Which, <laughs> which Vortex do you have on here? Uh, which one is this? That's their Gen 2, like high-end model, HD, whatever the heck. Okay. Yeah, you put me on the spot. The Razor, is that what they call their fancy ones? The Razor HD? Yep, the Razor HD. Yep, and this is a, and the numbers are really small, 18 to 3, 3 to 18. And it's got minute turrets, minute of angle turrets. And it's got, this is a first focal plane reticle. Now, do you know what all that stuff means, Casey? No. So Perfect. What's, what's first Perfect. focal yeah. plane? Why okay, so why? let's start off on scopes. That's going to be a very important thing. Rifles, most people know what a rifle is, you know. They can say action, you know, barrel, stock, you know, lock, stock, and barrel, and all that business, right? Um, and we'll go over the, some of those terms, too. But when it comes to scopes, this is where most people, especially for long-range precision shooting, need maybe a little bit of a, an introduction. So first off, this is a variable scope okay so variable means that you have zoom right you, you can know what zoom can, is you can change the magnification yeah right? you can change the magnification on these some of them are fixed power scopes when so we say that that means there's no zoom it's just one power right so this you can zoom in from three power which is relatively low so that so you can see a wide field of view but not very zoomed in on anything when you zoom in you're zooming in on a small area right so when you're shooting far the guys like to have the high zooms on there right now, first focal plane has to do with inside the scope, you'll know there's crosshair type deal, right? If you look through there, yep. <laughs> oh, man. You see a crosshair? I don't think this is for people with glasses. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get her trained up, guys. Don't worry, but we, we don't want to ruin it. We want to do this in, in, in the proper procedure so you guys can witness it all and make fun. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so there's a reticle in there, and that reticle has lines and all this stuff. You've seen pictures of them, right? Yeah. With all the crazy lines and stuff. Yeah. Those are usually in angular units, and you use those for holdover, hold off, and windage and all this business, right? So angular units, meaning like... like de all right, so for example, degrees, right? Yeah. Oh, see, we're getting into the, the gold already. So how many uh, degrees are in a circle? 360. 360 degrees in a circle, okay? Now, if you take one of those degrees, it's a real skinny slice, right? Right. Now, if you divide that into 60 little tiny slivers, each, your minute? each one of those are a minute of angle. That makes sense. Okay. Yep. Makes sense, right? So a minute of angle is simply an angular unit of measurement, which translates to 1 60th of a degree. So when you're adjusting your scope one minute of angle, you're moving at 1 60th of one degree, which is a tiny slice, right? 
But when you're talking about the rifles here, this is the beginning of your angle, and out at 100 yards, 100 yards away, a football field away, right? 300 feet. One minute of angle is going to be about yay big. Right. Just a little bit over an inch. And so a lot of people talk about one minute of angle equals one inch at 100 yards. And a lot of hunting scopes back in the day and a lot of, uh, you know, for sporting applications, that's in just for getting the rifle zeroed on paper, that's going to get be fine. So you know that if you, there's uh, turrets on here, right? This is how you move the crosshairs in the scope. So if you want to adjust up and down, left and right, so that you can sight the rifle in or adjust for shooting them far because you got to aim higher when you're shooting farther, right? Because the bullet's going to fly up and come back down. And the farther you shoot, you got to shoot higher. So you use these turrets to do that and just to screw in there and adjust it. But the adjustments are also done in those angular units. So it says on top of the turret here, one click equals 0.25 minute of angle. So a quarter of a minute of angle. So, so that means... A fourth of a sixtieth. Yep, a degree. exactly. So four clicks would equal one minute of angle, right? Which would be four clicks would be this far at 100 yards. Okay. But when you get out farther, that angle is going to grow. Right. So at 1,000 yards instead of being approximately 10 inches. Now, it just happens to work out that way mathematically where it's just a little bit over an inch, um, but it's not exactly an inch. So at 1,000 yards, it's more like close to maybe 11 inches. But it's practically 10 inches Somewhere right in there. yes so, like so that's how that deal works so that's what a minute of angle is now when you hear people talk about milliradians or mrads or mills like how many mills in the scope is it is it and a lot of the lines in the scope will either be in, in these lines in the scope are matching the turrets so those lines are also done like each line is one minute of angle apart right and you can use that for like, because when you have your long range firing tables, which tell you how far to hold off your wind or how high to hold above your target or whatever, uh, you need to know in some kind of angular units, you can adjust for it relatively efficiently, right? So the units inside the scope will match your turrets on this kind of configured scope. Some of them don't match, but. So how do you know where you want to place your minutes to hit your target? Very good question. That's where we come up with uh, ballistic tables. And it's quite complicated math. A lot of guys run computers, but we show in the tutorial series what inputs you put in and how to do the math or how to set up the uh, ballistic XLR tables or, or to run ballistic software. But mo nowadays, people run ballistics. When I first started doing uh, long-range shooting, I had a Hornady reloading manual, the second model, or it's the second version, which has all the external ballistics equations. And I sat there with a calculator and a notebook and I figured out every single one doing the longhand math Yikes. with a calculator. So I never had computers back in them days. And so I learned all the math by just the hand. And actually, my, forget my calculator one day. So you got to do it like by like multiplying stuff. You know longhand. what I mean? Yeah, so longhand. Um, so there's a lot of math in that <clears throat> to get it all correct. But that's basically what you're talking about when you're talking about turrets. So it's one of them deals. And milliradians is a similar system. Uh, it's, it's also an angular system, but it's based on radians. And what's a radian? A radian? Okay, so this is a good one. I'll put this down oh, for a second. He was wondering, is, is this even a good question? I don't even know. We'll come back to radians. Okay. Remind me, okay? Yeah. But um, how much does one mil cost? Is that a question? How much does one mil cost? <laughs> is, that, is that a bad question? I think he's being silly, maybe. Okay. <laughs> it might be a joke. <laughs> it might be a they said there are no dumb you. questions. Prove it. Well, like, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I'm just looking through to make sure there's no if you're buying a Schmidt and Bender with mill dots, you only have five on this side, five times four. You got 20 dots. You know, so you got 20 dots. You got to divide that into like 3,500 bucks. That's how much one mill costs. There. Oh, you, you like them apples. <laughs> I win. Do you prefer MOA or mill adjustments? Okay. Well, let's, so that's a great question. Mill radians, then. Yeah, mill radians. Let's first talk about what that is, and then we'll talk about which ones Rex likes better. Because that's just a different way of measuring, right? Yep. So there's two different, if you take trigonometry, there's two different ways to uh, think about angles, right? You got degrees, right? 360 degrees in a circle. And then there's mill radians or, or rads. You ever take trig in high school? Maybe back in the day. Okay. That's a long so, time ago. This is relatively easy to do. So, all right, picture, I'm going to show you a picture with my hands. You ready for this? All right, so, you see, you got a circle, right? And the radius is from the center to the outside. That distance, you fold it along the edge, right? So, if you're in the center of the circle, 
and you're looking at that same distance that the radius took that's folded along the edge, that section of pi, which is about like this, is one radian, okay? So it's the it's a distance along the perimeter of that circle, which is the same distance as the uh, so like the, v the radius that's shooting out is the radian. Yep, exactly. So that that slice of pizza is a full radian, and that's where the outside crust of the pizza mm -hmm. is the same from the mm -hmm. center of the pizza to the outside of the crust. You know what I mean? That makes sense. So it's a very symmetrical kind of way of looking at it, or it's a you know, and so there's like a little yeah, well, Dimitri. Who wants to talk to that communist? But um, <laughs> <laughs> he's probably watching. But uh, so, anyways, there's the crust and then the radian. So if you divide that, you got a bigger slice on the uh, pizza, right? Mm -hmm. And so you got a slice about this big. So if you chop it up into a thousand pieces, you got milliradians. Gotcha. So a milliradian is one thousandth of a radian, mm -hmm. which is going to in milliradian scopes are generally set up instead of four clicks on the scope turret being one minute of angle radians are set up so that 10 clicks equal one milliradian mm -hmm. so adjustments on mill based scopes are usually done in terms of tenths of a milliradian and the way that works out is that your millirate like uh there's like a little more than three and a half uh you know there's three and a half minutes in a mill or whatever right yeah. so like one mill or, or one mil at a hundred yards is gonna be like this, and one minute's gonna be like this, right? Mm -hmm. And if you chop them up, you're gonna find that the increments, your minutes of angle scopes with your four clicks per minute, and your milliradian scopes with ten clicks per milliradian, the mil scopes are gonna be a tiny bit more crude, and their units are gonna be a little bit bigger of units. So a lot of guys gravitate towards a philosophy that well. The minutes of angle are finer units, and you can make a finer adjustment, and that's true. So they gravitate that way because they can make finer adjustments. My personal preference is towards milliradians, which is a little bit more crude of an adjustment, but it is done in units of 10 rather than in fractions of 4. Okay, So it's a metric like uh, logic that they use to it. And so you got 10 clicks per radian. It's easier for me to add that up in my head and convert it to other stuff and keep it straight and, and graph out and things like that. Um, and plus, in all reality, most guys who are real anal about wanting the finest units are not making a firing solution precise enough, even close enough to get within three or four clicks. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's really the name of the game. If your firing solutions are so awesome and your uh, empirical uh, observational skills and data and everything is logged so well that you can adjust that precisely, then use it. Um, but in all honesty, you can favor the same using uh, the reticle of the scope and just like aim a little higher, a little bit lower if you are in between a click on an MRAD scope. So I generally prefer mills just because that's my preference. However, I do not think one is honestly superior to the other in any significant way. It's really a personal preference, whatever makes sense in your brain. So a lot of old school American hunters, like some, some of the best shooters that I know that I actually shoot with, participants of this project that we uh, helped me do my reviews are very into minutes of angle because they for years grew up on that. And so they intuitively know exactly what's going on downrange in terms of uh, minutes. They can just boom, they can miss by a certain amount or hit it or whatever, or or apply a lead on a target or a holdover perfectly in terms of minutes because they're familiar with it. So whatever you like is better is the answer to that question. There's not one that's better. Whatever, whatever you like is going to be better, Wh whichever one works better. But the main thing is that your scope units, the little lines in your scope, match your turrets on your scope. Now, the old military scopes, like the Leupold M3A that the Army uses on the M24, has mill dots, but then minute-based turrets. How does that work? Yeah, well, it works by having to, you know, yeah, you separate your data kind of. They would use the mills to apply wind holdoffs and target leads generally. Okay. And then they would apply all elevation based on the elevation turrets. So they would separate the two things and organize their data in such a way where they had one set of data in mills and the other set of data in minutes. That seems complicated. It is a little more complicated. And that's actually the way I learned. Uh, so I know how to do that. And I basically can translate between the two relatively easily. But if you're getting started or if you want to be smart about it, just do it in the same unit. It's a thousand <laughs> times better. Okay.
<laughs> kind of like learning a new language though you just right understand it yep so that's a, a real quick explanation and that's something that i hope people when they walk into the rx17 course understand that part intimately because i'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining it because it is kind of basics and if you guys want more information where i obnoxiously go through the details on that check out the sniper 101 series I talk about uh, mills versus minutes. I show all the math and give you the more precise numbers for those of you guys that really got in, get into the details. So, And you do go deep, sir. I certainly do go deep. So uh, we had a lot of questions while you were talking about Kate? that. So um, Coriolis shooting north and south, is all he said. Any Kate? comments on that? Yep. <laughs> we talked about that before, east and west and the difference there, right? Yeah. There, uh, now, just before we start the Coriolis drip discussion, we'll define what it is real quick, and then we'll talk about how important it is, and then we'll talk about which way it goes. Okay? So first of all, Coriolis drift has to do with you have a sphere. We live on the sphere of a, you know, the surface of a circle, a sphere deal called the Earth, and it's spinning on an axis. And it's differentially spinning at different rates on the equator. You got a longer distance to go, right? The rotational velocity is the same anywhere, you know, but on the equator, it's actually spinning physically faster, because not rotationally okay. faster, but it's physically right. Exactly. Cause it's got more ground to cover in the same in 24 hours. Where at a, yeah. Higher latitudes. It's got less ground to cover to make a circle in 24 hours. So you're spinning faster on the equator. And so as the curvature of the earth is spinning underneath a bullet, Newton's law say when you throw an object, like if I throw a baseball, the second it leaves my hand, it's not attached to the earth, right? Now, being that we're both traveling a thousand or almost a thousand miles an hour in this direction in outer space from the earth spinning, when I throw the ball, that already has that sideways velocity in the equation. So it's going to go straight. It's going to have that sideways velocity. Problem is once the ball starts traveling over the surface of the earth, it's traversing ground that is spinning at a differential rate now. So if you throw it in any direction, it's going to be over a different spot of the earth, which is going to give it what they call a Coriolis effect. It's going to appear, appear to deflect the ball to the right in the northern hemisphere. And in the southern hemisphere, it's going to appear to deflect the ball to the left. And uh, I did videos, uh, two or three videos explaining that in detail. Watch those. It's funny, guys. are like, are, I was reading some, uh, what do you call them, deals? uh blogs or something and guys are talking about coriolis and said oh rex you know his videos are good but he got coriolis wrong i would beg to differ um it's all very well defined science you can look it up in meteorology textbooks it's in the u.s army field artillery manuals the naval gunnery manuals they have firing tables it's all a very well studied science it's not like pretend it's a deal that actually exists and it is very well uh defined uh, so if you guys are curious on that, definitely check those uh, videos out or check out the sources that I cite in those videos if there's any confusion or debate. on. And sometimes the way I guess one guy explains it might not make as much sense as the way another guy. So check out other people's videos explaining it too. They're going to tell you the same things in a different way, okay? So how significant is it though? That's the question. So a lot of guys in the sniper movies, they're quoting like, so I got to adjust your Coriolis drift out there, you know, at that long range. And so they're talking about the stuff that's really small. What's going I, I on? had my hamster today. <laughs> <laughs> they're asking crazy stuff over there. Yeah. They've got some, some good questions and some funny ones. Yeah. But to make a long story short, Coriolis drift, even at very long rifle ranges, is going to move you like this much. Maybe, maybe this much if you're shooting really stupid far. You know what I mean? Like a tiny, tiny amount at the max. So that being said, um, at most, like we're at uh, 45 degrees latitude or 47 degrees latitude or 35 or whatever we're at. I'm not going to just close my latitudes, top secret information. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, like typically um, it's going to be a very small amount of deflection. But there's two components to Coriolis drift. One of them is horizontal drift. That's how far to the right or to the left is going to move you if you're in a different hemisphere. And the other one is up and down. And uh, there's two different components. Check out the video. I don't want to go on. It's like a three-hour visit. But to make a long story short, um, your latitude will have a lot to do with how much la uh, horizontal choreos you have. Okay? Your latitude. It doesn't matter which direction you're pointing. It'll always be the same amount deflection of going right. You had a good question there, though. What about shooting north and south? Shooting north and south, that is the component called, um, that's your uh, vertical Coriolis, up and down. 
So basically shooting north and south cancels it out. When you're shooting into the spin of the earth or away from the spin of the earth, it'll have a, a vertical effect. So there is a directional component to Coriolis drift, but it is the vertical component when you're talking north and south. So when guys are using a compass to adjust for the Coriolis drift, that's only affecting up and down. Your, your right Coriolis, Coriolis drift, your, the amount of lateral shift is only contingent upon your latitude. Two separate components. Guys get all confused about that. But check it out. And honestly, the corona effect is going to have a lot more effect than the Coriolis effect. And what's the corona effect? Oh, I'll show you later. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a challenge, Rex. Okay, I'm ready. My Back Hurts number one okay. has challenged Me too. you to uh, prove the curvature of the earth with a rifle. Prove the curvature of the earth with a rifle. Now, that's the thing where it would be easier to prove it with artillery because in small arms fire, it's such a tiny amount The things like wind, for example, a one mile an hour wind is going to push you way more off than all of the Coriolis drift you can conjure up. So you'd have to be in an underground, perfectly controlled environment shooting facility to eliminate all those variables and really nail it down. Or if you have Dapple radar to account in a, in a huge facility at your disposal they can account for every atmospheric variation on the whole flight path of the bullet you might be able to nail that one down it is an effect that i adjust for if i'm shooting like beyond a thousand yards and that's the other thing you know you never even adjust for it really even beyond 1200 or 1500 yards now for 50 caliber guys shooting at 2000 3000 you know at a scud or whatever or a missile van or whatever you know the radar van on on one of them uh, sam systems or something yeah, they, they adjust for Coriolis because then it's going to throw you off by a significant amount. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's an artillery thing, really. And the wind is going to, just like a subtle thing, like too much cheek pressure on your your uh, rifle stock or your, your bipod, like sitting on a twig and the other one sitting on the dirt, you know, that's going to throw you off way more than Coriolis effect or having too many Coronas the night before. That's, that's what, what that, that is. is. That's what that is, yeah. The Corona effect. Well, and that that one, uh, James Yeager came up with that one last time I talked to him because he he was making fun of guys who talk about Coriolis. It's like the Corona effect is way bigger. I'm like, yeah, I know. So he did come back with, okay, prove it with artillery. Okay, read the <laughs> U.S. Army Field Manual 6-40 Field Manual. It's been around, uh, They that's a science that's over 100 years old. And they have all, if you can look up the Army uh, Research Laboratory, the ARL, or the Ballistic Research Laboratory. They have all the scientific journal articles doing the math, doing the trig, doing all the calculations, and then demonstrating it in real life from various angles using all the proper equipment. But I'm not going to prove it. They already proved it. I'm sitting on this chair. I'm not. I'm not going out there to prove the Coriolis drift exists with artillery. Not tonight. I mean, we could, we could maybe try something like yeah. that. I got a copy later. of the 640 up there someplace. But, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go over and find it. I'm too lazy. So there was another question. One sec. FM 6-40. Oh, when are we going to do the meet and greet for long range shooting day? Somebody asked about that. The meet and greet. So for the people attending the RX-17 long range shooting seminar class which is a classroom deal that's coming up in june here uh, yeah very soon uh the meet and greet is going to be on friday night and we're going to be hanging out i believe it starts at six o'clock i'll probably honestly be weaseling around there someplace maybe i can imagine uh so if you can find the big fat guy with the sunglasses on his head um <laughs> uh, and you'll see in real life the, all this business that I put on lately, you know, it's uh, part of, uh, you know, when, when you, I'll tell you about that later. I can't talk about that. Okay. Yeah, never mind. It has yeah. to do with wrestling dudes. If you ever do that for a hobby or whatever, it works oh, way better. Geez. So <laughs> I don't do that anymore. I'm a good citizen. Get the guitar and start singing. What, oh. what do you think we are? <laughs> <laughs> Mariachis. <laughs> Just start. Hey, did you know that like in Guatemala or, or Mexico, um, if you sleep in a hammock, the, the local lore is that the mariachi will come and get you. Really? The They're not like, it's like nice a ghost. people? No, the mariachi skeleton mariachi. Oh. Mm -hmm. He's like the mariachi of bones. Like, So that's interesting. Uh, that's like mariachi, the, is that plural then? Or is it like one guy? I don't have any idea. Or a whole band? I, I, I don't know if it's the whole band or just the one guy. 
But uh, I thought that's not scary. If I was in the hammock, I would want a mariachi to come over. Right. Yeah. I, and then he'd have to feed me grapes too. Like, <laughs> give me some grapes. You play the guitar, and I'll sit here and eat the grapes. You know, that'd be awesome, man. I'm gonna go do it. I'm flying down there, man. Actually, yeah. Well, I'll tell you. Don't you later. remember my story? Which do you summon mariachis? <laughs> you open the circle. Do you, want, do you want demons? That's how you get demons. Oh, yeah. Watch the podcast we just uploaded about Casey's crazy times. So I told her about how to get rid of that stuff using Jesus, but she thought I was crazy. But no, she, she liked that part. <laughs> I was going to say, oh. Yeah, it's a good podcast. It was a fun conversation. We talked about lots of interesting old wives' tales and ghost stories and such. And I tried to attack it with both science and religion to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And just being, we had a good time. I thought it was a good one. So, we got any other good questions here? Was, okay, Rex, new shooter. Was sold a scope with the BDC reticle's second focal plane without much knowledge. Uh -huh. Found that scope isn't calibrated for 308. Yeah. Is it useless? Yeah, it's kind of halfway useless. Sorry. Aww. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, I mean I, I mean, I could pretend how nice it is, but it's never, I mean, if you got a BDC, what he's talking about, a BDC reticle is a ballistic drop compensation reticle. Okay. And if it's not in the first focal plane, that means that you have to be at one specific power setting to get it to actually work. Mm -hmm. Now, that's fine. A lot of them, they're, they're set up like a one to six, the, like the primary arms. Uh, you just crank up and max out the power, and that's the power at which it works. And so from one to five power, you're never going to use that where you need the BDC reticle. Mm -hmm. That's all point blank range type magnification. And when the bullet starts dropping enough to use the BDC, you're going to need to be on six power to see what's going on. So it's not a problem to put on six, but if the BDC is not calibrated to the right, you know, to that right sweet spot, that's actually useful for uh, like a, a, the type of ammo you're using, then it's useless. And most BDC reticles in all honesty are not really calibrated all that well. And even if they are in the magazine, where they say, like, they have a picture of the scope in the magazine, and they have all, oh, here's where it's 22 minutes or whatever for this line. Uh, that's hard. You got to cut it right with the laser beam. And there's only a couple outfits that, like, understand the math and then verify that when they get a shipload of them in, that they check them to make sure they're good. And so I review the ones that I like to use that actually seem to work good. And I got more reviews on them coming out, too. Um, so guys are continuously asking about rifles that are good for long range fighting, which is DMR applications. And so I'm reviewing a lot more of those and they're actually cheaper scopes too, because you don't need them fancy turret mechanisms to make them work. All you need is a really smartly designed reticle that's properly done. And you don't need the $3,000 turret app apparatuses that you get out of the German, you know, construction. So, um, there's some questions I'm not going to read, but will a bullet with a sufficiently high BC be able to get through the transonic zone with any accuracy? Oh man, the transonic zone. Generally speaking, guys, once the bullet goes subsonic or transonic, it's destabilized. Generally speaking, that's usually what happens. Uh, a lot of guys argue about that and there's debate on exactly why or what's going on or what the culprit is. Uh, there's debate about which spin rates work better for stabilizing the bullet through the transonic. But in all honesty, in my experience, it seems like when you approach transonic zone, which is usually beyond a thousand meters on most center fire cartridges, once the bullet slows down to within hundred feet, 50 feet per second of uh, that sonic barrier, you know, which is around a thousand, 1100 feet a second, 10, you know, a thousand, 60, 1040 feet per second. Uh, the bullet encounters the shock wave, which sends it on a kind of a wild destabilization process, and that screws it all up, and that makes it kind of hard to to defeat the transonic zone. Uh, there are technologies that are patented that supposedly work better to get it through transonic. I talk about that ad nauseum in my tutorials where we talk about transonic destabilization, but I have been notified by some very smart expert guys too that there's too much emphasis on that stuff and that it's really kind of almost a witchcraft science uh, trying to defeat the transonic zone using a certain twist rate, for example. Um, there are some arguments that overstabilization actually is better. And I think we talked about this on one of my last uh, live deals, actually. I think I rattled on for like 20 minutes on that question. So go check that out. And I got a couple videos specifically about that. Um, 
But uh, it's a debated topic, so I don't, I give you the ideas of what the debates are, but I don't necessarily clamp onto one of them and never want to, you know, let go of it because it's in the palm of my hand to be corrected. That's still kind of a cutting edge debate there. Um, do any of your videos go through making calculations or shooting from start to finish? Oh, yeah. Oh, you yeah. mean like from beginning like to finish? Straight through. Yes, we actually did one of those that was fun. Remember that, Lou? That fictionalization? Yeah, what's oh, it called? Oh, it's Santa. Right? Operation Big Red was what it was originally called. It's a fictionalized deal because it's very hard to show with the camera what's happening. I have a million videos of me doing that in the field, but you can't see what's going on. You can't see me whispering to myself what I'm doing. You can't hear. Oh, look at the fuzzy little fur ball. <laughs> look at that thing. Isn't it adorable? Yeah, she always wants to come up on the table when we're visiting. But um, what was I just talking about, man? Our uh, Santa video. Santa. Santa. Yeah. Because so the, a dramatization of it shows it a lot. The dramatization fluidly. is way more fluent. So it zooms in and shows what we're looking at. It shows what the spotter's doing in terms of calculations on the calculator. And then it cuts over to the shooter and what the shooter is then doing. And so it shows the shooter, uh, spotter, team dynamics and communication procedure that they go through when they're engaging a live target, how they correct for fire and then kill the target. Uh, so that's called like... America versus Santa Claus or some dang thing. Maybe we can find it on there. Maybe yeah, we'll there. find it on there. I'll post the link on the bottom. So after we're done with this video and it's not live, I'll put that link in there. <clears throat> but I do believe it's called America versus Santa Claus. One of my favorite videos ever. Yeah, Lou, uh, Lou actually stars in that video. He's no, the, I don't star in it. I'm, he's, <laughs> a, I'm, uh, he's the FDC in that no, video. He's the guy What's we call that? in for an airstrike. Or uh, artillery strike or whatever it is in that in that video, and he's the guy. Yeah, it's pretty funny. You'll you'll like it. You guys, if you haven't seen it, you got to check. There, it's really funny. And it's a little bit cheesy at first. We put a story on there. It got really corny. <laughs> That's not good production value. Yeah, no shit. It's us having fun. Okay, <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> it was fun. It was pretty fun. But I thought it was hilarious. But yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, Santa equals Satan. Oh, man. They're yeah. scrambling the letters. People you reading Blavatsky down there? Oh, Blavatsky scrambles letters to make all those little things pop out. She knows that stuff. Effects shooting over water? Shooting over water? Thanks, Ian. Sorry, I just yeah, had to thanks. say thank you. Thanks, Ian. My hair. Oh, your hair. You bet. Yeah. I'm pretty happy about it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, but She anyway. thought she looked Amish today. I felt like I looked a little Amish. She comes in, she's like, oh, I feel kind of Amish. I looked in the mirror. I'm like, Amish? Yeah, Amish or punk rock, you know, same thing, right, mm -hmm. Luke? Yeah. <laughs> All black. Yeah. Shooting over water? What were they asking? Uh, yeah, what are the effects of shooting over water? Uh, I, I don't know. I never really noticed any difference, I guess. I mean, it's cooler over water, so you got a higher air density, maybe. Does that affect, like... Maybe spotting your trace at all? Or I, I, I never, I shot over a lot of water, you know, in my day. Uh, I never really noticed any significant deflection, but maybe I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> Good question, though. Is, That's something is this to be interested in. Rex? No. 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> this is Casey Day. She's yeah. on the podcast show. Check it out. Say hello, Casey. Yeah. Uh, go on to the podcast. You'll know all about me, especially if you listen to episode 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. The, the latest one. That's rexreviews.org. Yes. And spread that around. That's going to be the top secret communication network after YouTube kills us all. This is also not Mrs. Rex. Yeah, this is. This yeah. is also Lou McCoy <laughs> from the podcast. Yeah, yeah. So these are the podcast crew members. And Lou also does a lot of uh, battle rifle scope reviews and stuff with me. So. I help him out. Yeah, he helps me out. He entertains when me when I'm needed. Yeah, um, right? There was um, some questions since we're doing the noob video. Uh, for handling the gun, mm -hmm. do you have a video for handling? Like marksmanship skills or just basic handling? Just basic handling. That's a good idea. That would be really smart to do. This one guy here, Southern Muscle, says being around water does change minute as minute aspects mm -hmm. of the surrounding weather. Yeah, absolutely, and that's what I was going to say, too. Uh, so so lake effect, or I mean, if you're shooting over a body of water, the body of water is almost always quite a bit cooler. Your air density is going to go up. Go up. Your humidity, obviously, might be affected, but that doesn't have a significant effect on um, air density. In all honesty, humidity doesn't. 
um, a tiny bit, but not as not as much as other stuff. Um, one thing is wind patterns are different. Sometimes you got, uh, you know, I mean, lakes can draw or, you know, winds or, or change wind patterns in areas. So stuff like that will definitely have an effect. It'll be a different effect than shooting over prairie. Yep. They're wanting to know if we could do a reloading tip video as well. I did uh, some of those in Sniper 101. If you want to check those out, um, just go through the playlist. And if you work your way through, you'll eventually see uh, a reloading basics video where I talk about what I pay attention to when I'm reloading. And I'm not a reloading guru, but I do get them good enough to shoot really good. So <laughs> there's guys who go way far beyond what I do. I'm just a practical reloader. I get them as good as I need them to be to where I'm not like spending 10 hours. Cause I reload a lot. Like when I get to reload, it's like an all weekend kind of process deal. It's horrible. So I can't afford to sit there and do it the whole day, you know? Well, actually, do do it for, the whole freaking month. Four sixteen Barrett Tactolite is that something you've done a review on? Yeah, Casey, send me message, message. for the four sixteen te barrel tactile. They want me to link it. Okay, so it was in your videos. Uh no, I did a I did a tactile T two review with a fifty cal. Mm. Uh, for they make them in four sixteen as well. So I thought you did tactile. Yeah, the tactile T two. Yep. This one? Oh, they want the link, huh? Yes. Oh, man. She's going to get it for you right now. Now, that is like top-notch service. Oh. You don't get that kind of service on any other live YouTube uh, channel situation. I'll tell you that. You should see if you can find the What link, about uh, fidget spinners? Oh, my God. What the <laughs> hell is a fidget spinner? You haven't seen a fidget no, spinner? A, a kid oh. told me what they were. I was going to say they're fun. It's some, it's some teenager was Tell me some about that. They're all the rage. Yeah, that's cool. You know, I think uh, yo-yos got banned in like Saudi Arabia. Really? Wow. Because it's like conjures demons and stuff or some kind of deal. Really? And so they're like, or infertility or some kind of weird deal. Huh. Uh, so then fidget spinners were the alternative. I don't I, Who was I talking to about this? <laughs> fidget spinners will fix infertility. Yeah, something. I don't know, man. I don't think that's how that works. No. Gives you can, something to do with it. <laughs> can you please describe ballistic coefficient? Ballistic coefficient, just in a real brief manner, is a characterization mathematically of the aerodynamic efficiency of a projectile, which means how aerodynamic it is, how well it's going to maintain its speed that it has and also cut through the wind. Okay, So higher BC value, usually expressed in a decimal form, a uh, number like 0.530, 530 is what guys would call it. No, 0.530, they'd call it 530, uh, would be a pretty good ballistic coefficient, whereas like 297 wouldn't be near as good. Uh, it's derived. There's different uh, ways to calculate ballistic coefficient, different drag functions and math functions they use. Some work better than others for different style of bullets. Long range modern rifle bullets, generally uh, the G7 model works better because it's using a test projectile that's shaped similar to modern rifle bullets. The old G1 drag model, what is used commercially, is not as good as G7, but it has been kind of sort of corrected in the math to sort of work for long-range shooting applications. I hope that kind of explains what that is. But when they talk ballistic coefficient, that's how aerodynamic that projectile is. So a bigger number is better? Bigger number is better. That means the bullet's pointier, is going to cut through the air better, you know, has better just flight dynamics. Gotcha. And we go into that in detail on the Sniper 101 series on ballistic coefficients. Yep. Uh, Projectile dynamics, maybe. Random questions mm -hmm. now. What is your favorite breed of dog? I don't know, man. Do you, have you know, a if, I, if I had to have a dog, I would, I like bird dogs, kind of, but not the really like stupid ones that just like run off with anyone they see. <laughs> like, I like, um, what's the Labradors, right? No, what's like the what's the golden ones? I don't know anything about dogs, guys. Yeah, the the labs are the crazy ones, right? Well, labs aren't crazy. They're crazy, like happy. They're, they love they're everybody. Happy. They're adorable, but they exhaust me. I don't need a dog the that excited. Golden exciting. retriever, you'd probably like. Yeah, the golden retriever is the ones I kind of like. I think they're more laid back. It's like they're more secure in themselves. They don't need to constantly be licking your head. Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, like. Just sit there and like enjoy my company. You know what I mean? Like uh, if Lou came into the house and just started licking me all the time, I'd have to, you know, we'd have to wrestle a little bit. So 
Uh, I don't the same thing. Last time puppy. I came in and humped your leg, man. No. <laughs> it didn't go over too well. Uh, the farm was dog weird. was wondering about uh, six five Creedmoors mm -hmm. versus a three oh eight, and which one you would prefer. Hey, so I got two six five Creedmoors here. I should show the other one too. So this is uh, that one, right? Yes, sir. And then I got this other one. I want a good one. You want? Okay, this is the heavy one, Casey. <laughs> okay. You got it. Yeah. So these are uh, six five Creedmoors. I'm going to test both of these rifles. This one weighs like it's pretty hefty. I think it's a sixteen pound rifle, uh, and this one is a super lightweight kind of model with the heavy profile carbon fiber barrel. Um, this one's got that uh, Actar on it, the Night Force ACTAR deal, and this one's got that Vortex. So we'll um, get these out very soon and actually test these out. These are made by Axial Precision. A uh, very interesting new company on the market, and they're just about to kind of like uh, go public with these deals. And I'm the first guy that gets to review them. Isn't cool. that fun Ooh. for on the video reviews? So I'm actually kind of excited and curious to see how these things perform. They got a different bolt design to them, um, and the action, and just uh, they're they're designed to be harmonically sound. Like uh, so, they have pan take technology and stuff. I'll get into it when I do the reviews. I don't know how it's going to work, but we'll find out pretty soon, okay? And, oh, 6.5 Creedmoor, right? So these, they asked me what caliber I wanted uh, to, to do the test. And uh, so I said, I don't know, send me one of your 6.5 Creedmoors. And so they sent me two of them uh, just to review, and then I'll give it back to them. But um, these things are like the hot deal on the market. Six Everybody's talking about them. It's yeah. the deal, man. It's like um, what... And if you look at the ballistics, it is a good, well-balanced round. Uh, I should release the video that I did with Paul McCoy where we talk about that exact question. That's what I'll do. I'll release that video. It's actually called 308 versus 65 Creedmoor. Uh, to be just to give you a sneak preview on my answer on that, 65 Creedmoor has superior external ballistics by quite a bit. Um, I think it's 30% less wind drift, half the recoil. Um, it's just, uh, it has a quite a bit longer max effective range due to its, uh, higher ballistic efficiency. <laughs> uh, for, oh, poor critter, poor little fuzzball. Obviously so not a dog guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they're the bees. You're knees, so. pretty, huh? They're the bees knees. The six, five does everything. That they're this versatile. actually, yeah, it's like one gun to rule them all kind of deal. They're good for varmint hunting. The PRS guys love them. Uh, long range shooters love them. They're easy to shoot. They fly good. Uh, deer hunters love them. They even work on elk if you use the right bullets and for tactical applications, they're real good. That's cool. Um, however, for training purposes or world war three purposes, um logistical superiority is going to take precedent in which case the 308 is the better choice uh so that's the the long answer in a short way kind of you got a package over there too don't you Rex? yeah what's in that box <laughs> well yeah i was gonna open that this is actually something i always kind of wanted to try unpackaging oh, gosh, <laughs> This is a live unwrapping here. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. I, I like Optics Planet, man. They like actually have. I never even really. I always used to like buy from SWFA, and I still do once in a while. Like they, they are the guys that sell the super sniper scopes. So if you want a super sniper, you got to go there. But Optics Planet has like all kinds of stuff too. And when you do a Google search online for like stuff, and you're looking for stuff that's affordable. Optics Planet is usually pretty hard to beat. So if you're trying to buy, like, also if you need like rings and a base and a scope and a sling all at the same time, they have so much stuff. They're going to have exactly probably what you're looking for. Another box. Oh, for gosh sakes! What is this? Some kind of sick joke? And also a coupon if they. And apparently they wrap their stuff good enough, huh? Uh, they get a discount if they use your name at the checkout. That's right. I secured a discount for anyone. Who wants to buy any scope stuff because i'm like the scope guy right rex is the scope guy so being the scope guy i told them guys you need to hook up my my people with some cheaper scoping you have you have no idea what this is i forgot <laughs> <laughs> i think i know what it is hey can they see this on the old camera you think yeah oh it's a radius 
Mm-hmm. You know what that is? Yeah, half a circle. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, well yeah, the distance from the center to the outside, you're a smart one. Radius. It's a freaking laser beam. What? What's the, is, what is this? Did we get a shark with it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sure some of you got that part. Laser beams and sharks. <laughs> All right, check this out. Get you petting your cat. Yeah, <laughs> All right. So it's packaged in here. And you got yourself a weird little unit like this. I'm going to wake out this camera. What in the heck is that thing, huh? Okay. So you got knobs and a readout back here. <laughs> what you got is laser beam inch. And you got a range finder. And you got an IR illuminator. Hmm. So this is like made for big rifles. I'm going to put this on like my battle rifle for night shooting and for range finding. So I wanted something, and it's a little bit goofy looking, but I don't care. Like I really don't care. And it, but stout. If we happen to get a shark, mm -hmm. it would look really cool on its head. Yeah, this would mount very well. Well, we I got a cat. With cats <laughs> laser have beams cat. on their heads. But yeah, this is cool. This is uh, made by Silent Chico. It's called the Radius, and I will be reviewing this soon. Uh, but this is like, you know, in the nighttime, you can laser beam stuff with your IR designator. So if you're running night vision mm -hmm. in tandem with other stuff, you can just put on your NVGs or whatever and just like laser beam stuff and shoot it, you know, within the max range and, uh, without having to adjust for your drop or whatever. Or you can range targets. Now, I always have laser, laser range finder in my kit just so that, you know, I can, if I need to verify range. But you always forget to grab it when you get up to FFP or something happens. You lose it. You can't find it or it's too much. Of, you know what I mean? So this thing mounts on a rail. So I got a rail on that uh, Mirage ULR chassis on that 7mm Dash 300. This clips right onto the side or on the top underneath your scope or wherever you want. And this attaches to the rifle. So it's a, mainly what I like about it is a laser range finder that attaches to the rifle. You just reach over and it's always there and you hit your button and it gives it spits a range out at you. And you'll, you can zero it in using a laser on with your crosshairs too. Hmm. So you can use the rifle as a precise aiming point. That's the other thing too, just even uh, last weekend, we're using uh, laser range finders to try to distance targets out there. And if you got a sloping angle, it's hard. You don't know exactly where that laser beam is hitting. So your level of confidence is not as good, but you can calibrate this and sight it in a lot better. And then you have the other capabilities of all the other stuff on this unit. So stay tuned for this deal, guys. This is going to be interesting. I always wanted to play with this unit. How much does it weigh? Mm, I don't know. We'll put that in review whenever I do it. Good I'm, not a good, I'm not a good judge of weight because everything's light to me. I don't know. Like, guys, like, that gun is heavy. I'm like, what? I'm going to guess a pound and a half. Okay. Maybe yep. two pounds. This guy would know. You work with different items. Yeah, I've held stuff. He's held, <laughs> I've he's held stuff. stuff in his day. <laughs> I don't even know what anything weighs. I mean, I can tell about how much rifle weighs, kind of. But yeah, so that'll be fun. Check, yeah, pretty exciting, huh? I'm excited. You've got new toys every time. I know, every day. It's my job to have new so toys. So speaking of, what are these up here? Did we show them these? Oh, oh, we're gonna use this for when I was explaining mill radians and stuff. Minutes of angle. I was gonna say, here's the turret. You know. By the way, there's turrets on scopes. The top one is usually for up and down. Side one's usually for sideways. Okay. So to go back to our uh, noobs basic discussion, yep. we're talking about uh, uh, variable power and mm -hmm. front focal planes, stuff like that. Oh, we never. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, we need to get a little deeper into that, don't we? Because mm -hmm. we kind of left them hanging. Yeah. Yeah, we're like, uh, what do they call that, ADHD mode? Yeah. At least I am. Stay on task. So why do they say, so what's first focal plane and second focal plane, okay? <laughs> so you got this light flying into the front of the scope. Your, your head is back here. The light flies in, goes through these lenses. It's flipped around, and then there's a, a rector assembly, which erects the image back upright, right? Mm -hmm. And then so by the time it gets through all the stuff in here, it's upright again, and you're looking at the right side up. Otherwise, if you just had, the, you know, a lot of times in the old days, the old pirate scopes, the image is upside down. You know what I'm talking about? So you got to re-erect the image. 
Oh, are they saying stuff about that word, Casey? Is that what you're smiling at? What? What? No, no, that's fine. No, I was laughing because you said back on topic. No, sure, After back on topic. <laughs> no, my brain was in the gutter that time. Yeah, I'm not even I'm sure sorry. where you were going. I screwed it up. <laughs> so anyways, you got a, focal, a series of different focal planes in scopes, right? So depending on, there's different places, the crosshair, the reticle, you can put it back here. You can put it in the front. You can put it, you know, there's different places you can put it, right? So you got a lot of magnification stuff going on in the optic, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have a zoom assembly. So where is the best place to put it if you don't want the crosshair to ever shift from the image? So when the crosshair is against an image and you have mills hashed out in there, and you want those mills to always like be one mill instead of like zooming in on it, you got to place the reticle in the proper plane the first. The first focal plane. So if you put it up here and you're zooming in on stuff, you're zooming in on both the uh, image and the crosshair at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So that the crosshair will be pro proportional to the uh, actual image, right? So your crosshair is going to be like always the same against the backdrop of the target so that no matter what power you go, you're always going to be able to tell like how many mils tall the target is, how many mils lead you need to go in front of it, how many mils or minutes of angle, whichever your preference, you know, wind hold off, do you got to apply that kind of deal is better. Now, if you put it in the rear, when you're zooming in on stuff, you're zooming in on the target, but not on the, what well, did I get that switched backwards? I think you got it right. I don't remember, dude. I'm tired. <laughs> so maybe I got, did I get that backwards, you guys? Anyways, the other one, you zoom in on the image and the crosshair is not getting zoomed in on because it's behind all that stuff, right? And so it stays the exact same and you're zooming in on stuff. So proportionally, the target's growing in your scope because you're zooming in, but the crosshair stays the same. Therefore, now it ain't a mill against the target. It's all whacked out. So you got to pick, you know, so it's, if you're using the reticle of the scope and you have a variable, it has to be in the first or the front focal plane yep. so that it works good. So if you look in there, you're going to see all kinds of weird stuff going on, right? Okay. Can you kind of see stuff? So I see the hashtag. Marks. Yep. The hashtags. The hash. <laughs> the hash marks. I'm using that one. <laughs> the scope is equipped with hashtags. <laughs> Hashtag argrid.com. Hello. <laughs> Okay, so there's hash marks. So then what you're saying is if I zoom it in, that's going to stay the same. Uh, just go ahead and zoom it in. It'll the be this one? rear thing right I here. I take my glass. No, that's cool. We're going to do an experiment. Okay. All right, I'm ready. So this ring back here, sister, this that, one? no, this this big dial right here on the back. This, the one in my hand? Oh, here, let me show you like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to show you. This deal right here, This it twists kind of hard. Okay. See those numbers? Yes. That's your magnification. So that's how you zoom in on the scope. But you got to twist it hard, okay? Okay. If it was made in Germany, you wouldn't have to twist it so hard. So. Now, on these kind of uh, rifle optics, in order to get the best picture, you will have it about two and a half to three inches away from your eyeball. Oh. Yep. There? Oh, it's that's different than a binocular or a regular telescope or a spotting scope. Rifle scopes will have a certain amount of eye relief in front of your face. Oh. So, yeah, this doesn't really change. Here, that. come this way a little bit. They can't see your reaction. Oh. Okay. So, you're seeing how it's, uh, you're zooming in, but the, the actual uh, reticle is growing and shrinking along proportionally with the size of whatever you're looking at, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, that's the first focal plane optic there. So, that reticle is useful at any magnification super important concept to understand when we get into optic selection oh, that's weird what are the little thingies that move around the outside of the ring little things that move around what are you talking about like there's, there's like things a ring. moving in here yeah there's a ring about? in there and then there's a black ring Oh, yeah, these are kind of fancy uh, scope scope reticles. I'll have to show you. There's a lot of stuff going in on there. There's a big, like, uh, circle-shaped deal. That's for at the lower powers. You can see it better. But, yeah, I'll, I'll show you some of that one. We're going to take you out shooting. You know this, right? Take Lou to. out shooting? No, no, you're going to go shooting with us, aren't you? Lou would love to go shooting. No, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'll pick a rifle that has zero recoil, like one of these 6.5 Creedmoors. It will be like a BB gun. 
I promise. Are right? you sure? Maybe mm -hmm. no, I seriously. could go tomahawk throwing and you guys. <laughs> it actually, you know, out of all the different kinds of shooting, this is the least scary. Because if you get situated with a nice rifle with a good muzzle break or whatever, there's no recoil. You lay there and it's just you're perfectly comfortable. It goes and then it's not loud. It's not scary. And it's awesome. We'll let you try it. You'll try it one time. And if you hate it, then you don't have to do it anymore. But you have to do it at least once. One time. One time. One time. We'll record it. Yeah, we're we'll, we'll, <laughs> absolutely. We got any other good questions from these guys? They've been typing stuff. Okay. That's super close to your face. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty funny. <laughs> Is that a black eye prank? <laughs> <laughs> shoe polish on there. Yeah, shoe polish on there. It's hilarious. I remember them good old days. Uh, moose hunt in northern BC, Rex? Moose hunt? You taking me to northern BC? Uh, Daniel wants That's to. an invite? Oh, of course. Yes. Seriously? Mm -hmm. Is that guy From serious? Daniel. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I hope he hears that thing because I'm saying yes. Hey, on my, uh, what do you call it? RexReviews.org website, there is a contact Rex directly button. For training inquiries, or you know, we can trade training for different things like that, or for whatever. Moose meat for moose meat. I'll I'll trade you training for moose meat for sure. We'll let you come take a, a rifle class for for in trade for moose. That'd be something, wouldn't it? A moose hunt. Oh yeah. I'll, Copy. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Seriously, cool. just let us know. <laughs> now, if you screwballs just type random, oh, I better not encourage them. <laughs> better not do that. I'm gonna be a bunch of smarty pants. I got 9,800 emails I haven't answered. Seriously. Yeah, I got it my phone laying over there. I can prove it. Wow. You should almost hire a secretary. I know. It's about to that point. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already a secretary. She's, oh. she's the volunteer part-time secretary. Yeah. I know. <laughs> you guys don't know how much uh, hard work these guys put into the project. Just like ridiculous. But we're all having fun, weren't we? That's the yeah. bottom line. Mm -hmm. Sasquatch hunt in Indiana. Indiana. Ooh. Oh, I'm game. That's my cup of tea. <laughs> Let's do it. Oh boy, <laughs> look what we started. <laughs> Sasquatch <laughs> hunt in Indiana. You know, I almost shot a couple Sasquatches, but then I thought I probably better not do that. You don't want to be famous for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. right? Um, Some drunk kind of Sasquatch suit or something. <laughs> uh, you know, they have places like, dude. There's this place in. It's by Helena, Montana, just on Avon or one of them little towns up there. And they have like every year a Sasquatch hunt that's like world famous. And all these people go up and drink a lot of beer and then drive around in their four wheelers out in the woods and hunt the Sasquatch. And they have a guy in a freaking Sasquatch <laughs> suit running around. Really? Now, if I'm thinking <laughs> they need to advertise that better because there's guys like me that used to like be up in them woods. And if there's a Sasquatch and I'm young and stupid enough, oh, yeah. I'm going to be the guy that sacks the Sasquatch. Absolutely. Guaranteed. So you guys better be darn careful with that deal. I mean, I'm not threatening nobody. I'm trying to help you. So be careful. You know, like advertise. Hey, by the way, the Sasquatch is not real. Don't actually hunt it or shoot it because there's a lot of crazy people in that one. all time you want. Then you throw in the Corona effect, man. <laughs> yeah, you throw in the Corona effect. Oh, oh it's really dangerous effect. Rex. Uh, what is your opinion on the 195 GR burgers in 7 millimeter rem mag? Yeah, those are incredible. I just bought two boxes of those when I was, yeah, I was at this really cool gun store that I like to go every couple of years, and they actually had them on the shelf. That's what I use in that 7 millimeter 300. That's by far the craziest BC you can get in a 7 millimeter that I found outside of Elko. And burgers, they're very consistent right out of the box. Burgers right? are, that's like their thing. You know what I mean? Sorry, they asked for a direct link to contact you. Oh, dear Lord. Don't make it easier for them. That's going to make all the drunk guys get a hold of it. Well, this is for Daniel. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> and we'll see what happens. There we go. <laughs> um, no, no. What else we got going on here? Should I bring a Mill Dot Master to class? Yeah, sure. That's a good idea. You can show show how they work. Um, I'll, I'll try to bring mine, too, because I will show it. It's part of uh, the peripheral equipment selection that we're going to get into. Rex okay. needs a hotline. We actually do have a hotline. We do have a hotline. Yeah, we do. I'm not going to post it, though. 
Hey, you know, we could do that next time we do a live one, Casey. We could, yeah. we could talk we could to them. We do some hotline questions next yeah, time. Yeah, we do that on the podcast, you know. Yes, yeah, if uh, you guys tune cool. into the podcast. Yeah. We got any other cool questions or we're going to shut her down? Um, ba -ba. I got a big steak upstairs with my name on it. Oh, what was your favorite beer? Favorite beer? Chimay Grand Reserve is probably the best one you can find in the States. It's made in Brussels, Belgium. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was there in a train station one time, you have to use the bathroom and you have to buy stuff in order to use the bathrooms over there. And so I was in there and I thought, man, what do I, oh, you got anything local? And the kid's like, oh, you bet. And so he poured me just a tiny, they had served in that wine glass looking thing, bit of Chimay Grand Reserve. And it was like a whole different planet, dude. It's a Trappist style ale, which is the monks from like back in the day. Um, you know what I'm talking about? You did a whole review on it, I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah, I did a review on it. There's a video of me drinking a bottle of it. Yeah. <laughs> me and, me and uh, Voxel are drinking the Chimay Grand Reserve, and we review everything on this desk that was laying there. It's the salt, salt shaker, <laughs> scopes, right? There's like a gun laying there or something. Yeah, it was fun. That was a good video. Check out the Chimay review. Just look back in my videos. You'll find it not too far ago. Uh, that was That's a good one. That's the best one you can find in the States. My my favorite one ever was, I think, a Austrian beer. or No, I, I, was, I found it in Vienna, but it was like a... I think it was... Bavarian or something? Yeah. Zwetler? W is no uh, Z W I E T T L E R, and it was the Dunkels, I think, variety, and it was really good. Now the one in the United States that's kind of tastes like that is actually that tall grass. Uh, uh, what is it? Buffalo sweat. It's like an yeah. oatmeal cream stout kind of flavor deal. It's a similar malt to that. I don't know. I don't like to just sit there and drink Budweiser to get drunk all day. I like to have my fine ales, right, Lou? Yes, because you are sophisticated. I'm a sophisticated fine. one of them guys, just in case you didn't notice. Actually, I laid way off since the election is over. That deal had me. Yeah, she, she's, she's rooting for me. But uh, So I laid quite a bit off there. And, and you know it's perfect. We all got our deals. But, uh, yeah, it was getting out of control there. Like come, people come over for the debate, and I'm like, you know, can't handle it, dude. <laughs> hey. Rex's uh, live stream confessional. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> what ah, else we got? It's been good. Um, hold on. What's Chimay, yeah. Chimay yeah, that's in right. there. John Spence. Seven millimeter STW versus seven millimeter three hundred. I like thought. the seven millimeter three hundred just because I can find brass any place on earth for it. You just run the brass to the die and then you reload it for it. STW is a good round. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not like, I mean, ballistically, you know, it's similar. Um, but Winchester Magnum brass is easy to find. So that's the way, that's the reason I went for that particular cartridge. It's logistically superior in terms of reloading components. And it's still like ridiculously hot. It's a good load. So I think that's all of the good questions we had. Yeah, that was fun, guys. Um, and stay tuned if you are assigned to the RX-17 class. Um, I will be sending out some material here pretty soon. Actually, when we send out the uh, newsletter for the podcast, those of you guys that ain't signed up for our newsletter are missing out on like a huge amount of stuff. Go to rexreviews.org, sign up for the free newsletter. There ain't, you know, you just put in your email address. And then we send you all the cool updates and all the top secret videos and the top secret information and any training events that are coming up actually that's gonna i'm gonna we'll put the training announcement in this upload that we're gonna do sometime tonight hopefully um so we'll put that in there too we're gonna do another class because so many people missed out on that so for those of you guys wanting to get in that class this will i'll either have the tickets available sometime tonight or tomorrow that's my plan and when they go up, first come, first sub, uh, if you want one, grab it quick. Last time it sold out quick. Actually, we did the shooting part of the RX-17 class. Uh, for those in the actual class, we did the live fire instruction, the second portion. And I only advertise that with the people in the, the seminar first because I want to give them dibs. So if you get in the seminar class, you're going to have dibs on all the other classes because I kind of want you guys to have the seminar experience 
before he gets you out there live on the range. So you have the right equipment and you know what you're doing ahead of time so that you can actually shoot a lot of stuff and learn the real detailed stuff in the shooting part. But that, that, that class sold out in less than a day. Serious. Yep, the shooting part of the class. So it's gone like instantly. Um, so you guys will have to, uh, if you do want to sign up for the second seminar, it's not going to be that crazy. We had some sponsors cover us in our travels and stuff to where we could make it stupidly low priced, like underpricing everyone else on the market for this one we just did. It was only $300 for a seminar ticket, which is way underpriced. This one's going to have to be normal price. I think we're going to be somewhere in the $600 range because the average going rate is bare minimum uh, 300 a day. Is That's like the lowest I can go without getting my butts kicked by all the different reviewing or what do you call it, training guys. Because I don't want to undercut everything so bad. But and that's the and honestly, it's expensive to fly down there and set it up. Uh, so we need to and to charge a reasonable amount this time uh so just stand by if you do want to jump in on that class we'll make that available like tonight or tomorrow but if you want dibs on where those tickets are at get in rexreviews.org and sign up for the free newsletter and we'll also send you updates on all the podcasts too if you haven't checked out the podcast you yeah. should do it because there's a lot of good stuff on that. yeah it's us guys sitting around for four hours every podcast shooting er the breeze on everything and not just us we've got guests yeah we got guests we had rob ski on we have all kinds of other guests like experts in the industry we have religious guys come on all kinds of really interesting conversation for sure from all different necks of the woods so for those of you guys that want to check out a good conversation and just want more of this and it's way good audio quality oh, yeah. a thousand times better than any of the video stuff uh we got the professional grade like uh announcer guy. equipment guy right here that one this guy is you see his microphone has stuff on there i don't even know what it is <laughs> you know what i mean so that's fancy man yeah but uh, <laughs> we have a good time there and we we do a lot of stuff that's yeah. not we probably couldn't do on youtube and we address uh questions and answers in a much more serious way too these live deals on youtube are fun but we're kind of put on the spot and we're usually tired when we're doing them. But in the in the podcast, we really go through and we select some really good questions. And we make sure we give you good, thorough answers. We talk about all kinds of dynamic concepts. For those of you people who are interested in the details of long-range precision shooting. So if you're into that, we also talk about Bible stuff. That's where one of my part, favorite parts of the show is the Bible study part. I really enjoy doing that. That's kind of fun. It's like... A regular person's Bible study, not some church guy's Bible study. <laughs> we do it for normal guys like us, you know. And uh, even for people who ain't into it, it's a lot of fun because we tackle it from every different uh, angle and talk about all the possibilities, scientific, uh, you know, Lou? all that stuff. What? Oh, sorry. Somebody asked about who you were again. You guys got to listen to the podcast. He's on there. This is Lou McCoy. This is Lou. Don't you know Lou? There He's been go. around for a while. He's been around for a while on the podcast. I'm, Check it out, guys. I'm linking the podcast. Click the link. <laughs> yeah, there's the link for the podcast. In the con yeah, see that there? See over that there. over over there? Over there on the thing, the side uh, discussion. I did uh, that for you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> not, only, not only does Casey take care of most of uh, the stuff for the live broadcast mm -hmm. here, she's also built us an awesome website. Retroviews.org is yep. all of her handiwork. And... If you're into any of the conversation on the podcast, we've got some kick-ass forums on there, and you can continue the conversation there with the whole community. And that's really what's kind of cool about it all is that it's a big community, and you see mm -hmm. people coming out and uh, it's just a turtle, <laughs> just being very supportive, and uh, it, it's it's just cool, man. It's synergy, definitely, and it, it's it's a good fl dynamic flow, and we do have a lot of really awesome guests. Uh, so you guys will get a kick out of it, and we get into some heavy stuff, man, and some silly stuff, too. So we, we get – it's like when you're recording a good rock and roll album, like a good album by, like, a band that's not just, like, a one-trick pony, but an actual talented band will have a ballad, and then they'll have just a real rockin' song, mm -hmm. and then they'll have, like, a kind of a weird one, and then they'll have, like, the instrumental, and they'll mix it in there in such a way to where you don't get bored listening to the album. That's how we try to mix up our podcast. We keep it – we keep it flowing in a dynamic way and so that uh, we don't fuck anyone off the horse. So, rock and roll, guys. Thanks for checking us out. Uh, we will be around and check out the brand new podcast that just came out, rexreviews.org. 
and sign up for that newsletter. And if you want to jump in on the next training session, we're thinking that one's going to be late July. We're going to finalize that here in the next few minutes. And then as soon as we can build up the deal and uh, make tickets available, they will be available, but they're going to probably sell up pretty quick. So if you want to trick, uh, it's going to be a classroom deal, the seminar part, which is the prerequisite to the live fire instruction. And you're going to learn a lot of stuff in the classroom part. We're going to really streamline it and tell you what you actually need to know. And if you're curious about what that's going to be, check out the video review on RX-17 is what it's called. And uh, we talk in detail with Mr. Paul McCoy, the guy uh, that's participating on his half on the equation on that deal. And uh, we'll give you the full rundown. Absolutely. So hope Make to see sure. you guys there in June. It's going to be fun. Make sure to subscribe to that newsletter. That's how you get the quickest updates on everything we release. Yep. So. That is the best way to do it. And the biggest favor you can do for us, if you like the show, if you like the podcast, is share it. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Yes. Tell, yeah. tell your social media people that we exist and get the word out. Absolutely. That. That's the best thing you can do for us is subscribe and uh, share stuff because it's we got to win this gun culture battle. And the only way you can do it is to make it mainstream. Well said. People are scared of guns because they've never seen them before. They haven't been around them. All they know about guns is Hollywood movies and uh, what daytime TV shows tell them. And so that's the problem. So uh, familiarization and you know spreading the culture, showing that it can be a gentleman's sport as well or a smart guy's sport is what we're trying to accomplish here with the long-range shooting. It's a very disciplined martial art. It really is. And we're going to explain that more in the seminar too about kind of the general philosophy of it. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be awesome, and uh, thank you so much for all your guys' support. And subscribe and spread the information. And thanks for joining us tonight. Yep, rock and roll. We'll okay. catch you guys on the flip side. Click on the link to go and subscribe. Yep, rexreviews.org.